lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. Yeah? Doing okay. Doing okay. <laughs> Only okay. Yeah, well, you know, it's a uh, it's good Friday, so I'm doing good. It is a good Friday. Yeah. Um, I don't know where to, where to start with this. Ah. I don't know what what you want to start on. I want to open with war or close no, with war. No, I don't <laughs> want to open with war. Uh, we can open with like I had a hard time finding places for um, to put all the guns that I brought back to my house last week. Oh, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> Could be. I don't have ammunition for everything. Yeah, um, that's a bad problem to have because yeah. ammunition is hard to find and pricey. Well, some of it. Anybody's interested in um, a 12 gauge shotgun, I, I have two to get rid of. So, Michael at the Liberty Market. <laughs> yeah, all right. for all your 12 <laughs> gauge needs. We'll see. We'll see if we can work something out. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. okay. So, we finally went through. All right. This is, I'll say, um, it's a good thing probably that uh, my dad sold off most of his gun collection after he retired. Uh, from law enforcement. Yeah. Because there's no way y'all could have went through all of them had he had not. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I remember there was a time where you couldn't, like every flat surface in the house pretty much had <laughs> was... some form of, of firearm on it. Yeah. Um, there were only a dozen or so, I guess more than a dozen. But it, yeah. anyway, there it, it was certainly much easier than it could have been. There were only a few pistols. Yeah. Um, but there was a time when my dad must have had 30 pistols. And yeah. so, you know. Uh, I won't disclose how many pistols I have. I have an undisclosed amount of pistols. <laughs> I, yeah, well, me too. Um, and now I have several more shotguns and rifles as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway, yeah. Um, but when I, I got home, I realized that, well, first off, I've got a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so there's like stuff everywhere. And so finding places to put things yeah. <laughs> ended up kind of being difficult. Uh, Gotta buy you a safe, man. I have a safe, but it's, I don't have like, a, I don't have a, a tall safe. Gotta buy a gun safe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have a tall safe. So none of the, none of the long guns could go yeah. in my safe. I definitely like having a gun safe now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was nice to pick up some things that I like, I remember. And, uh, and of course my brother and I didn't argue at all about who got what, um, which is also nice. I I don't expect that we, I didn't expect that we would, Yeah. uh, but um, it was the same way with me and my brother going through my dad's collection. And he had a probably a little bit larger collection from the sounds of things than what your dad had. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was, I mean, a lot of it had already been decided pre like dad had said, this gun's yours, this one's yours. So Mm -hmm. it it wasn't, there were some guns that was some discussion on, but it was all pretty, pretty simple to, to lay out. Well, and some of the guns that dad had were specifically either mine or Daniel's too. Um, so like he had our, um, our dove hunting shotguns. Yeah. And so we just, took our own guns and yeah. um there was a uh a deer rifle that he'd gotten for me that he wanted a as a door prize at a gun show by the way <laughs> um so That's that one was already mine and then there was another deer rifle which was dad's deer rifle so we just gave that one to daniel yeah um and uh there were only a couple of things that i was like intent on that weren't specifically mine that i that well, i wanted yeah um and they were both twenty two rifles, so it was not really that big a deal. Yeah. Um, so one of them is the... So our neighbor, when we first moved here, um, this uh, our neighbors were this older couple. Um, it's hard to say that now, but they were in their 60s then, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, he... I guess once he got to know Dad and found out Dad was working with the FBI and, and uh, was a firearms instructor and so on, he had... Um, an old 22 single shot, uh, that was made before World War II, wow. um, that he had put away somewhere and he was like, well, why don't you have it? And so he gave it to dad and yeah. he had stored the bolt separately and couldn't find it. Oh no. Um, and the gun was so old that they didn't make the bolt for that model anymore. So we had to have a bolt machined nice. in order to use the the rifle. Yeah. Um, and it, it is probably the most accurate rifle I've ever fired in my life. 
I used yeah. to sight it in with thumbtacks at 50 yards with iron sights. Wow. <laughs> and um, I can't do that now because my eyesight's not good enough. But, uh, yeah, all right. Because <laughs> um, I can't see the thumbtack anymore. can't see the thumbtack, yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, like, it's a really, really accurate rifle. And uh, and it's really the gun that I learned on. Yeah. And so I, I really wanted that one. To, yeah. Um, and then um, there's a, 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 a tube-fed... Uh, pump action 22 rifle yeah that i just think is cool <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> and uh and there was no argument for daniel from daniel about either of those so yeah. so i got them well cool yeah now we need to go shoot them <laughs> yeah i need to you can come over one day with uh, with your uh cleaning kits yeah and <laughs> probably one of the things that the first things that we need to do is go through and clean every gun in my house yeah you yeah. can bring your guns too. I'll help you with your guns if you'll help me with mine. We'll have a gun cleaning party. That sounds <laughs> yeah, like fun. Exactly. I always enjoy those. Because <laughs> um, uh, like the one we brought down from the lake. Yeah. Oh, that needs, gun. That gun needs some help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that gun um, needs some. Attention. Really needs cleaning. And yeah. then I found almost all the pieces of my CZ. Oh, nice. <laughs> almost. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> all the pieces of my CZ. I don't know what Dad did with the rest of it. I. Yeah. Uh, I might, I may never get to shoot that gun again. <laughs> oh well, um, it had problems too. It jammed all the time, and I was, I was kind of disappointed. Which is the reason it was in pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, yeah. Oh well. Uh, <laughs> now that we've wasted everybody's time with that, we have to figure out where to start. Um, all right, you, yeah, you do your thing. I was gonna say, so Elon yeah. Musk is. I guess attempting to buy Twitter is the news is it was my big news of the day yesterday. Um, so uh, I guess a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, maybe not even a week ago, mm -hmm. he bought a majority share. So like 9% or 11%. I can't remember. I think it was 9%. Um, but that made him a majority shareholder. And so they were trying to get him to join the board. Well, he declined that because he wasn't done buying shares and decided that he just wanted to buy the whole company as a whole. Mm -hmm. I guess yesterday, that's the news broke of that yesterday, that he had made an offer to buy the whole company. Um, and I think this is big news because what he wants to do with it, I think, is pretty cool. He wants to turn it into a truly free speech platform, mm -hmm. which anybody that's on Twitter now, which I'm not yeah. on Twitter, by the way, um, but I may be depending on how this plays out. Yeah. Um, is, I have a Twitter account that I haven't logged into in probably six years. I, I don't even have an account. Like mm -hmm. I, I know nothing on Twitter at all. But um, but it's not a free speech place now. No. Like it's it's definitely. Um, and so a lot of people are upset about that he's that he's trying to do this, which is crazy because some of the same people, uh, these people just want censorship. I guess. Like it's, I mean, that's basically the, the fight that's being had right now. Well, is, I mean, you got to kind of think about it um, as if you agree with the prevailing opinion, why would you want any other opinion to be expressed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I saw just today, there was a bunch of um, people making posts and stuff just saying, you know, that, you know, that not if, if, if. Elon Musk takes Twitter that, you know, Nazis will have a voice again and that kind of thing. I'm like, and I'm not a Nazi, but I don't have a pro. Like if, if your ideas are better then then show that they're better. Like there's, yeah. you know, it, it, that doesn't, that argument doesn't stand to me that this person's so bad that they need to be censored. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the other thing is that if you take away somebody's voice, there's only one thing left. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's not the other voice. That's them taking action. And yeah. that's the that's the problem. I mean, yeah, exactly. The, you know, a, a real, you know, Nazi fascist, whatever, can't There's, really defend their position. No. Um, effectively. But if you put them in a position where they, they don't have to, where they can't be challenged, essentially, because they don't get to express their opinion, then it's easy for that ideology to grow yeah. um, and to really take hold of, of people. 
because then they're in their own little echo chamber yeah. where all their ideology is just reinforced, which is a problem that you see in the left right now. But, um, right. <laughs> but it, you know, it happens in these, you know, smaller groups, subgroups as well. Like, like, you know, I guess, uh, white supremacists in the U S which well, there are not that many of, but anytime, you, anytime you push speech down, mm-hmm. you, you, create an opportunity for it to become violent. Yeah. Like, and that's something we've talked about on the podcast uh, many times that's that we've had this subject come up. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's the danger. And that's the reason that these people aren't hurting anything being out there saying their stupid stuff, stupid stuff, because everybody knows it's stupid. They, (laughs) they don't have a, it's not like there's a majority and you're pushing down them. These people are nothing, (laughs) you know, they're laughed at. Yeah. So why 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 the why the big huffle over that? Mm-hmm. Um, um, I can almost guarantee that if you allow people to express these opinions, that more of them will be converted away from it than towards it. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but you're right because they'll they will see the stupidity in their argument yeah. and give it up. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them, you'll always have it. There's, there's plenty of idiots. There's, yeah, there's crazies. There's idiots out there. You'll always have some of that, but you're right. As far as the major, uh, the best way to combat it is to have it out in the open. Um, and wouldn't you rather know who these people are anyway? Yeah. I mean, it makes more sense to, to know who they are versus have, have making right now they're forced to hide in the shadows. Like that's not good. Well, uh, the, um, the online game that I play, has, does uh, decals, yeah, um, like old historical decals and so forth. It's a war game thing. Yeah, um, but they also have decals that are just like numbers and letters and and what have you. And uh, they announced this week that they're disabling a bunch of decals uh, because of laws that have been passed in some nations uh, against displaying <laughs> some decals. of these things. Yeah, um, that are depicted in the decals, and they don't want anybody to get in trouble. So they're they're yeah. um, but it's including, like, just numerals. Really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure specifically who, like, what nations they're talking about, but I did hear that in Germany um, they have made it an offense to display the letter Z. Really? Because the letter Z uh, shows um, some kind of uh, affiliation with the Russian military. Um, hmm. And so they can no they longer... Yeah, so now the yeah. letter Z has been banned, banned. in Germany, essentially. <laughs> right. And um, and I guess what bothered me about it is because the, there was a, a chat group discussion about this, and um, and one of the the comment that stuck out to me um, was somebody saying, "Well, it is what it is. I don't have a real problem with it." And I wanted to say, "You should." Yeah. Like this is a real problem. Like the 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 idea of government restricting free expression, like restricting you from being able to express your opinion, whether they find it offensive or not should be a problem for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's not their because place. just just because they're not coming after you now doesn't mean they won't in the future. Yeah. Um. Because times change and mm. and the the I say the country, but the world in general is moving more and more authoritarian. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's not going the other way. Yeah. <laughs> like, um. I was having a discussion about this with my brother earlier today, and uh, you know, we, we agreed that the idea that people this movement towards bigger and bigger government everywhere um, just seems absurd Yeah. because like, what have they done yeah. to, what, to what help they, to fix your problems? Well, what, what did they do to earn it? Like that, that would mm-hmm. be the question I would ask. What has government done that was so good and so great mm-hmm. that we want to give them more power? Yeah. I was just reading, I, like I didn't get to read the, all the comments, but um, I, I, meaning the comments from uh, vice president Harris, but yeah. there was a, uh, a, uh, a press announcement on whitehouse.gov that I was looking at right before you, you got over here today um, that was talking about uh, what the government is doing to reduce the cost of health care. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> what happened last time you tried to reduce the ho- cost of health care? Yeah. Like I mean, this- the first thing, like, it was essentially this administration that yeah. tried to reduce the cost of health care before under, under Obama. Under Obama, yeah. And they tripled my health care costs. Well, they've done the same thing with um, college. Yeah. I mean, all of the stuff that's been done over the years has been to reduce um, 
you know, college yeah, tuition. Let's try and make college more affordable. More affordable, and it's done nothing but make it, but make the problem worse. Yeah. Like I mean, anytime you inv- governments, they're just not. They don't have the tools and the capability to do these things, mm-hmm. regardless of what they tell you. Um, it's just, it's not how government's structured. Yeah. And the absurdity of it is that people keep falling for it. That the argument from the government is, well, if you just give us the resources, then we can fix this problem for you. Yeah. And then when you give all them, evidence to the contrary, and, and then when and you give keep them, doing it. well, and then you give them the resources and then it doesn't work. And they're like, well, we need more. Yeah. Like, yeah. If we had only done more, we could have done better. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this crazy thing. And, and the whole idea that government is uh, across the globe is getting bigger and bigger is just a, it's definitely something to keep an eye on and be concerned about. Mm-hmm. Um, um, this relates to another discussion that I was having with a friend. Um, and, it's about so he he was telling me that the problem he has with the libertarian uh, outlook is that people make bad decisions. Yeah. That you can't trust people to make good decisions. And of course, my first response is, well, that's true no matter what your government system is. <laughs> yeah, um, it is, uh, that is true. Like, I mean, people make bad decisions. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, the other part of that is that uh, government creates perverse incentives, like we were just talking about. That that yeah. failure is an advantage because you get more resources the more you fail and the worse you fail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the term you use a lot, failing up. Yeah. <laughs> which I, which I like. I think that make that's exactly how government works. <laughs> and so um, the you know the point to make there is that people would probably all right. I do believe that people. I do believe yeah. that people make um, decisions that they think are best for them at the time. Yeah. There are exceptions to this. I mean, you know, like not all decisions are rational. Um, and like the best example I could give of that is just in relationships. Like, have you ever been in a relationship that you knew was bad for you, but you stayed with it, you know, for whatever reason, because there was, I don't know, because of, a um, because there were good times and you expected more or, maybe just because of the memory of good times or whatever. Yeah, there's all kinds of reasons. You suffer through all the other stuff. People, and, people do stuff like that. And, you know, the, you know, and the best thing to do is to just end it there. Like, the yeah. The, yeah. the longer you let it fester, the harder it's going to be. Yeah. That's my lesson from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's absolutely true. But um, but the point remains, you know, that that's the best example I can come up with of, of people continuing to make a decision that they know is a, is bad for them. Yeah. Um, but they stick with it maybe for fear of, of an alternative. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times that's what it is. Yeah. Um, uh, well this is better than being alone or whatever, but, um, but for the most part, uh, people make decisions that they think are the best, most advantageous for them at the time. At the time with the information they have available. Right. Um, and that's why the market works the way the market works. But, um, but that's a different part of this discussion. <laughs> yeah. The point that I would make to my friend is that um, the government creates these perverse incentives. And so you see a bunch of bad decisions that people are making, people that are, that are destroying their lives because they have, you know, a dozen kids yeah. um, that they can't afford or, you know, whatever it is. And I would say that if you look at, at what they're doing, either they're doing it because there's no risk yeah. Um, or they're doing it because it does provide a benefit to them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in most cases that is uh, government that's providing it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the government is either creating a safety net so they can make bad decisions and there's no harm in it. Yeah. Um, so they don't have to worry about the risk. They can only concentrate on the possible reward or that it, there actually is a reward in the bad decision. You have a dozen kids that you can't afford, so the government starts paying you for all of those kids. Yeah. Um, so now you got this income that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. And, it, and it may be that th- that income doesn't match what you would have saved if you hadn't had all those kids. But, um, but it's a living. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not what I was going to say. Um, but you know, at least in the mind of the person, what yeah. they're seeing is just an, the benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, they're, they're missing. It's the broken window fallacy from the other side. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that people would make better decisions if they didn't, if they weren't offered 
bad incentives or outright coercion by government policy. Well, and my other retort to that is, well, if if we need government because people make bad decisions, where do you draw those lines? Yeah. Like, what about the people in government when they make bad decisions? Yeah. That's the other well, response. A- oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, because government is ultimately made up of people. Yeah. <laughs> so Usually notably ungoverned. Ungoverned, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, but where do you draw that line as far mm-hmm. as, okay, you know, um, especially, and we've seen this line be drawn before as far as trying to regulate um like food and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. like, you know, banning trans fats and things like that. People have got to be able to make their own decisions. I remember the big gulp fiasco in New York, like banning the big gulp. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I mean, these type of things, that's what you get when you're like, when you, well, people don't make good decisions, so we need Mm -hmm. to make them for them. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you're advocating for is, is that type of government. You're also assuming that the same decision is good for everybody. And that's not true. Because I need my big gulp. (laughs) <laughs> right, like, right. got to get some sugar in this. Man. I got, I gotta have that. I gotta have my sugar. Like, yeah. you, you don't want to be around me. I promise. Like, I've got to have it. Like. Yeah, um, it, yeah. The, it, there isn't a one size fits all policy for 330 million people in a nation this size. It, exactly. ju- it just doesn't make sense anyway. Which is why we advocate for for more localized government control. Um, if you're going to have government at all, it needs to at least be familiar with the struggles of the people that it. Governs. That it's, yeah, that it governs. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the other part of the argument that that I think we... I don't know if we ignore it too much because I'm, I'm not sure if people, if people think about this in these terms. But even if you think you can make a better decision for somebody about their life than they can, what moral right do you have to make that decision for them? Yeah, exactly. And at what point does it become slavery? Yeah. Like when you start making decisions for somebody else's life... At, at what point have you moved past a line where it's not their life, where you've taken control of their life to the point that they are essentially a slave? Exactly. And I and I hope at this point in 2022 that we can all agree that slavery is bad. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> something that I've definitely like. People have made a determination on that. The people have spoken when it comes to slavery. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, you know, where do you draw the line? Is yeah. is the right question? And so the. You know, the response should be the best place to draw the line is right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Like, their life is their life, your life is your life. There's some nuance where the two meet. Yeah. You know, there's decisions to be made, but it doesn't have to be legislated in the same way. I mean, it does outline the importance of uh, some kind of legal system. Yeah. um, Or judicial system, justice system, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But um, but the, the moral stand and the, I think it would be borne out the mo- the most effective stand is to let people make their own decisions about their life, which is like one of the f- the founding tenets of this particular podcast yeah. is people should be able to make their own decisions about their lives. Absolutely. Um, and if you are taking that ability away from them, then you're a slave owner. Right. <laughs> there you go. Um, so on that happy note, yeah, now that we've beaten that to death, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, where do we go from here? I I think that we go, uh, actually, all right. So uh, (laughs) I was watching, uh, Saved by the Bell because it's available on Netflix right now. And it's been a long time since I watched it. So I've been going through Saved by the Bell and it is super cheesy, like does not hold up. (laughs) Um, but, uh, there was something in an episode that I watched, um, recently that, that seems relevant now. All right. Um, and they were having a, uh, a costume ball at the school. And the principal, Mr. Belding, made it a point to say, and remember, the men that are dressed up as women still have to use the men's bathroom. And it was like a joke. (laughs) And there, and now it's an argument in 2022. (laughs) It is an argument. (laughs) And, you know, this was only 30 years ago that the show was made, roughly, something like that. Yeah, approximately. Um, and uh, and I, I just I found that interesting, especially in light of um, Jen Psaki's recent comments about the Alabama law, yeah. uh, the Child Protection and something something Act. Anyway, um, well, let's just start with her a little bit and we can address this piece by piece. All right. Uh, across the country, 
As we've talked about a bit in here, Republican elected officials are engaging in a disturbing, cynical trend of attacking vulnerable transgender kids for purely partisan political reasons. Today in Alabama, instead of focusing on critical kitchen table issues like the economy, COVID, or addressing the country's mental health crisis, Republican lawmakers are currently debating legislation that, among many things, would target trans use with tactics that threatens to put pediatricians in prison if they provide medically necessary life-saving health care for the kids they serve. I love how COVID's the, the one of the issues that she brings up. Does she not realize COVID's over in Alabama? <laughs> yeah. We're done with that. Like, yeah, we, we've moved on. Yeah, yeah we're past it now. <laughs> yeah. uh, like a year and a half ago. Yeah, exactly. Done. <laughs> Roughly. Um, well, okay, so I did find it interesting that she says that instead of discussing kitchen table issues, yeah. um, and I would suggest that probably one of the most important kitchen table issues for a family is how their kids are being raised. Oh, without question. <laughs> oh, there ain't no question about that one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You you hit it on the head with that. Um, and then she said, or mental health issues. You could make an argument that they are addressing mental health issues with this. Yeah. Um, and, of course, she makes it a point of saying th this is life-saving medical interventions. And she's got more to say about that. But, um, <laughs> but well, let's just keep playing. <laughs> let's, see, let's hear it. <laughs> Just like the extreme government overreach we've seen in Texas, where politicians have sent state officials into the homes of loving parents to investigate them for abuse just to harass and intimidate the LGBTQI plus community, today's vote in Alabama will only serve to harm kids. But Alabama's lawmakers and other legislators who are contemplating these discriminatory bills have been put on notice by the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, my smart ass commentary first. I find it really interesting that anybody in the Biden administration would criticize somebody else for government overreach. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm not sure what specifically she's talking about in Texas. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I know we that, talked about the Florida bill, but I don't remember Texas having one. Yeah. But maybe they do. Well, I, they have some version of of the of the Florida law. Do they in um, in Congress right now, in their state, in their Congress, state Congress, yeah, uh, I think. Um, I the only thing I could think of actually is uh, remember the story that we covered. It was a long time ago, actually. Now, um, where the uh, the lady had twins and was um, the couple had twins and she was like making one of the twins into a girl and the husband. Or the ex -husband, oh, I do the, remember. The, that was a while back, but yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. Um, that's the only was case that I can, about it. Yeah, yeah. That's the only case that I can think of that she's talking about there, but I, I don't, I don't know specifically. Yeah. Um, now the, the disturbing part of this is like right at the end, uh, where, um, she says the department of justice and, uh, and health and human services have put these states on notice. Yeah. So, and that goes back to exactly what we were talking about earlier, where the big about governments, government overreach. <laughs> well, about big government, your 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 federal government reaching in on local issues. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is something that clearly states can decide for themselves, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and I have an agenda here. Like, I agree with the what we're doing here in Alabama. So you know, mm -hmm. woe is me, but I don't think that the federal government has a right to come in and try to step on that. Well, I have the bill right here too. So we'll, we'll address, um, I'll some pull some specifics. parts out of the, yeah. the bill. I actually think that the bill was really pretty well written. It's, it's very specific in what it restricts and, and the reasoning for it and so forth. I, I thought that it was it was quite well done. Um, but let's, let's see what the department of justice and health and human services are, are telling, um, the states that are considering these laws. <laughs> that laws and policies preventing care that healthcare professionals recommend for transgender minors may violate the Constitution and federal law. To be clear, every major medical association agrees that gender-affirming health care for transgender kids is a best practice and potentially life-saving. All of this begs an important question. What are these policies actually trying to solve for? LGBTQI plus people can't be erased or forced back into any closets, and kids across our nation should be allowed to be who they are without the threat that their parents or their doctor could be imprisoned simply for helping them and loving them. Uh, President Biden has committed in both words and actions to fight for all Americans and will not hesitate to hold these states accountable. Okay. I would like for her to point out to me where in the Constitution 
it gives the federal government this power. Right. <laughs> um, because the only thing I can think of in the Constitution where there that addresses something like this at all um, is the Tenth Amendment that says that the states <laughs> can have the power of anything that isn't explicitly given to the federal government. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what she means there. Um, and then there's some stuff in there that just, uh, I would say, charitably, that the jury is still out on. Yeah. Um, now, the you know major medical associations may be pushing gender-affirming health care right now, but I would say that it is it is far from certain that it is even helpful. Yeah. Um, I would I would argue the opposite, but yeah. you know. I mean, from what I've seen, uh, it doesn't have any impact on suicide rates. Yeah. Um, so, like the idea that this is life saving. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a that's a, actually an absurd point to make anyway. Um, yeah. Life saving health care in in when you're talking about healthcare, you're talking about emergency services. Yeah. You're talking about life-saving interventions that prevent somebody from, from sudden death. Yeah. Essentially. Absolutely. Um, this doesn't qualify. Yeah. At all. By any stretch. Um, but, uh, but even the idea that these, uh, that these medical interventions for trans youth are saving them in the long run, I don't think has been borne out by the data. Now, mm. if I'm wrong about that, if somebody has access to data that proves me wrong, I'm happy to look over it and change my position, but I hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. And, um, so that actually kind of brings us to the actual bill, the bill itself. Um, because they address this in the bill, um, cause uh, you know, generally bills have a reasoning for them at the beginning and then they talk about what they actually do. Yeah. Um, and that's the case with this bill. So I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, I might read this whole section two and section three. Anyway, um, this is what they, the Alabama bill actually says. It says, uh, the legislature finds as follows. One, the long-term effects and safety of the administration of puberty-blocking medications and cross-sex hormones to gender incongruent children have not been rigorously studied. Absent rigorous studies showing their long-term safety and positive benefits, their continued administration to children constitutes dangerous and uncontrolled human medical experimentation that may result in grave and irreversible consequences to their physical and mental health. I think Checks that's out a reasonable, so far. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a reasonable first point. Yeah. Uh, two. Studies have shown that a substantial majority of prepubescent children who claim a gender identity different from their biological sex will ultimately identify with their biological sex by young adulthood or sooner when supported through their natural puberty. There is no psychological or medical test that can differentiate between the majority of children who will desist from their gender incongruence and the minority who will not. Research shows that the administration of puberty-blocking medications or cross-sex hormones forecloses the possibility of a natural recovery from this condition. Now, I can see some people on the left saying, well, you're assuming that this is a this is some kind of defect that they feel this way. Yeah. Right? And well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I, here's here's kind of where I stand on this. I don't mm -hmm. think that I don't think children should be subject to this type of thing. If mm -hmm. they if they truly do want to do this, that's something that needs to be done as an adult. Yeah. Um, once, well, the argument there is that it's too late. Like they've yeah. already gone through puberty as a uh, um, whatever their biological sex is, and th that's irreversible at this point. Of course, yeah. the the point to make there is that the opposite is also true. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's kind of the point is that you know I mean it's I I don't think I just don't think that that teenagers even teenagers uh, particular and like really anybody teen, below a teenager mm -hmm. needs to be doing that to their body. I don't think that that's, a, I don't think it's a logical yeah. thing. No, like, I, I it agree. doesn't make logical sense. Like, I mean, it, because just because you feel that way now doesn't mean you're going to feel that way in the future. And there's no turning back once you make some of these decisions. Yeah. Um, and, and you're just not mature enough at that age to make those decisions. <laughs> Uh, I find it interesting that if you are opposed to genital mutilation in one form, why aren't you opposed to it in another? Yeah. Like when they talk about um, the genital mutilation that goes on in uh, like in Muslim cultures, as yeah. an example, they're not the only ones, but yeah. um, you know, those kind of things where this is a, this is a, an outrage yeah. yet 
when you're talking about children in the U S yeah, going through genital mutilation because of what may be a mental health issue. Yeah. Um, I, I would I, say that I, it's I, far from resolved that it's not. Yeah. And in, in fact, again, the data is kind of on the side that it's a mental health issue, but, yeah. um, or just a phase, like exactly. not even a mental health issue. in in some cases, just like kids being kids and, and having, Oh. Some confusion about the world around them. And part of your job as a parent, I think, is to try and and help a child navigate the world with some concrete ideas. Yeah. And one of those concrete ideas should probably be the binary of male and female. Yeah. And I know that that's an unpopular opinion, not down here for the most part, no. but I, I know that that's a, an unpopular opinion to express. But this is kind of like a founding biological tenet. And yeah. it affects everything. It, it affects everything in life. Yeah. Um, there's a, most relationships are in some way defined by the, uh, by the, the gender split. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and actually it's a, it's a legal concept as well, which is why I was so annoyed about our new, uh, Supreme court justice, not being able to define woman Yeah, because the, the identification of male and female is actually important to the interpretation of law. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Um, is important to the interpretation of law. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this tear down of like one of the most fundamental building blocks of, of, uh, social interaction and civilization, I think is a real problem. Oh, it absolutely and, is. And it's not to dismiss the idea that there are, like, genuinely um, trans people that, like, will never be comfortable in their own skin. And so, I mean, yeah. you know, it's not to dismiss them. Like, people can make people can make their own decisions about their lives. Absolutely. Um, but this is something that, that should require careful contemplation. Yeah. Not something that well, should just be... You know, they should be pushed, and which is what the which what, is which is the prevailing medical opinion now is that if somebody says that they feel if a biological male says that they feel like a woman, you encourage that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's gender affirming healthcare. That's yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, and I think it's it has created some problems. Oh, absolutely. It has. Um. So anyway, uh, so number three. Um, there are no rigorous studies that show that gender changing therapies performed on children, including the administration of puberty blocking medications, the administration of opposite sex hormones or surgeries intended to approximate the appearance of the opposite sex have any long term beneficial effect, including a reduction in suicide risk. To the contrary, such interventions carry elevated risk for sterility, loss of sexual function, bone fractures, thromboembolic and cardiovascular disease, malignancy, and may even contribute to mental illness and suicide. Yeah. Like maybe this is something that we should resolve yeah. through study before yeah. we, you know, jump in on a on a plan. Oh, absolutely. Like, um, you know, the the left always talks about data-driven policies, data-driven yeah. le legislation. Um maybe you should let the data come in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but what's happening is that they're actually ignoring the data that is coming in. Yeah. And so um, the, you know, the, they close it with the, the continued performing of these therapies upon children constitutes a public health risk. Um, uh, and what they say is any Asian employee official or contractor of any legal entity or of a school district or the state or any of its political subdivisions or agencies, um, cannot prescribe, dispense, administer, or otherwise supply puberty blocking medication to stop or delay normal puberty. Um, or, supply, administer, dispense, prescribe supraphysiologic doses of testosterone or other androgens to females, same uh, for doses of estrogen to males, perform surgeries that sterilize, including castration, vasectomy, hysterectomy, ophorectomy, orchiectomy, and penectomy, um, perform surgeries that artificially construct tissue with the appearance of genitalia that differs from the individual's biological sex, uh, removing any healthy or non-disease part, uh, body part or tissue, et cetera. This is a class C felony. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the other addition that it adds, um, is that a, uh, um, let's see, let me find it. Where'd it go? 
Oh, uh, no nurse, counselor, teacher, principal, or other administrative official at a public or private school attended by a minor shall do either of the following. Um, and it only lists one thing, so I, I don't know if there's something missing from the bill or if they actually cut some part of it. Something and out, then, yeah. yeah. Um, but it says, uh, withhold from a minor's parent or legal guardian information related to a minor's perception that his or her gender differs from their biological sex. Wow. All right. So, you know, the other thing that they prevent is is other adults um, helping your children along without telling you about yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that that's perfectly reasonable as well. Absolutely it is. Now, and so. I understand that there are situations where... Um, where you would want to hide something like this. I think we talked about this maybe last podcast. Probably. Um, where, you know, maybe you know of a parent that's uh, either ultra-religious or ultra-conservative or whatever, or, or, you know, just homophobic in general, yeah. and the child thinks that they're uh, gay or trans or whatever, and you don't want that parent to know because you're afraid of some kind of physical, you know, violent response or Something like that. Yeah. Um, but the answer is not to help them transition on their own. Yeah. Like, you, it's time to talk to somebody else. Like, yeah. there are counselors and various... Um, professionals. Yeah, professionals that are uh, intended to deal with these kinds of situations. Absolutely. So, and, uh, you know, again, I like, I understand the um, problem with me advocating that you... S- you go to a state counselor or whatever to do this, <laughs> but it's better than the alternative that's available right now. And, well, exactly. Um, they're still professionals. I mean, yeah. even if they are paid for by the state. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually think that this is a, this is a, a good bill. Um, it, what it's really preventing is um, doing actual physical changes. Yeah. Um, it, it's preventing, it's not preventing, uh, psychological counseling. It's not preventing, you know, anything like that. Yeah. Um, what it's preventing is actually like starting the process of transition. Yeah. Which I'm, In like I, said, I, yeah, I, I completely agree with by the yeah. way. Um, so the, like what they're claiming about this, it's, it's not, it's not what they're claiming first off. Um, and some of the claims they are making about this being life-saving interventions and so forth is, uh, certainly not, um, settled science as they would say. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I like the specificity of this bill. Um, it is very specific about what it permits and what it does not and what it requires and what it does not. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're going to legislate something like this, you can't ask for better than that. Yeah, I I, I would agree. Um, so you have anything else to add to that no. particular point? And we spent think, probably more time. I'm, I'm sorry to read, like read a bill on air, but it was fairly short. And I thought like, nobody's going to look this up yeah. and I, I think, it's, it's worth people knowing. Yeah. Um, so then finally, I guess uh, our last little thing is that while I am not advocating for Putin's war in Ukraine, yeah. Is it absurd that I have to start with that? <laughs> um, I am going to continue to debunk some of these stories of uh, of atrocities of you know Russian attacks on civilians where I see them. Yeah. Um, because you don't have in at least in the U.S. right now you don't have access to an alternative point of view on this. Well, not easily anyway, yeah. and certainly not in the mainstream. And we're not mainstream either, but, um, you know, if, if, if your access to news is us in the mainstream, I'm at least going to try and provide a counterpoint. Um, so the recent, uh, Russian atrocity was their missile attack on a busy train station in Kramatorsk or however you say that, um, in the Donbass of people trying to leave, actually it's like barely in the Donbass, but, um, of people trying to flee the Russian invasion and they're, you know, lined up for trains that weren't running as I understand it, but, uh, they did have buses running. So maybe that's where they were meeting for the buses. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure. Um, but, uh, anyway, the, there was a missile attack there that killed, um, somewhere around 50 civilians. And there were a whole bunch of like really sad news reports, the, yeah. you know, children's bloody children's toys on the ground and, and things like that. Yeah. And it is, it is, it's terrible that this happened. Yeah. 
Now, was it the Russians that did it? That's the question. That's the question. And there is certainly evidence to the contrary, just like there has been in all of these. And the Russians have, from what I've seen on their official stuff, have mostly fessed up to like the things that they've done. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, denied things that are less likely that they've done. Now, it could be that they're lying about that. I'm, I won't yeah. deny it. This is by no means definitive, but let me yeah. let me paint you an alternative um, with some evidence again. Uh, so to begin with, the, the missile that was recovered or the pieces of the missile that were recovered in the attack um, are from a Tachkayu missile, yeah. which the Russians do not use. Yeah. They used to. Yeah, but they don't anymore. It's yeah. it's been discontinued in their military services. Um, but uh, Belarus uh, still uses it, and so does Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. So um, they're like one of the big parts of the story was that they found the tail section, uh, which is the booster and the fins and so forth yeah. uh, that separates from the warhead shortly before it reaches its target. Yeah. Um, they found the you know the booster section in, in a parking lot near the train station and. It had painted on it for the children in Russian. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course there was a big deal made out of that because the, the first thing that was said was that like they, they're attacking civilians and they said, here, here's a missile for the children. <laughs> you know, those yeah. terrible Russians. Um, of course, an alternative explanation that was also given was that the, if the Russians had painted that on a missile of theirs, um, it was for the Russian children that had died in the Donbass <laughs> yeah. over the last uh, eight years. Yeah. Um, 14 years. Yeah. 14 years. Since 2008. Not eight years. Since okay. 2008. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but here, here's the, the part. Uh, now, seeing a, uh, um, a geospatial analysis of this yeah. uh, with the understanding of how the missile works, where um, there's a warhead attached to this booster section. Uh, the booster separates shortly before impact, um, leaving the warhead to continue on its path, and the booster section falls to the ground. Um, the uh, um, people that have mapped it have shown that the booster section fell short of the train station uh, to the west southwesterly direction, yeah, um, from the train station. Now, um, because of the way these things work, what you should be able to do is essentially draw a line from the point of impact of the warhead, yeah, through where the booster section was found, yeah. and that'll give you the direction that the missile came from. Yeah, that right? makes. I mean, I, that's your ballistic line. Yeah. Okay, so if you do that, it goes west southwest from Kramatorsk. Um, now, uh, Kramatorsk is partly encircled by Russian forces. Yeah. The direction that the Russians have not been able to close the circle is to the west. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so there are no, um, based on these reports, there are no Russians or Russian-aligned forces to the west-southwest of Kramatorsk. Yeah. Only Ukrainian forces. Yeah. And the Ukrainians still use this missile and the Russians don't. Yeah. And so chances are yeah. it was a Ukrainian missile that hit the train station. Which now, makes you wonder, what were they doing? Was this an accident? Well, or? that's the other question, right? Was it intentionally, um, were they were they attacking their own people to uh, get, because obviously, like you hadn't even heard about this story. I, I so obviously yeah. um, the world is moving past Ukraine and, and not caring about Ukrainians anymore uh, ever since um, Will Smith slapped yep. Chris Rock. That seemed um, to be the reset. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, it could be that they, you know, that they, that they had um, attacked their own people to try and create an uh, outcry again and get the focus back on Ukraine. Yeah. Um, because, uh, Vladimir Zelensky is still groveling all over the world asking for more weapons and, and so forth. Yeah. So, um, that could be, and it. it's crazy because I have seen some of that. Like, yeah. I mean, I saw a couple of interviews with him, but nothing mm -hmm. about this train incident. So. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, he's, a, he's, he's, he's on a one track mind. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, but, uh. The all, you know, of course, the other thing is that they may have been firing it at Russian forces because there, if the if it had continued, yeah, 
along that same trajectory, it would have eventually hit Russian forces. Yeah, maybe they just... And um, you've got to think that you're probably dealing with people who aren't... I'm not going to... Totally proficient with yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're not... I mean, I'm not saying they're, that they don't know what they're doing, but they're not... They're not our military. Like yeah. they're, they're, they don't have the resources and the knowledge that our military would have to operate such a thing. Yeah, this is not a really uh, like high end guided missile or anything either. I mean, yeah, they miss. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, I, I think that that's actually probably the most likely thing that happened is that they were firing it at Russian forces and they missed, yeah. and then they tried to take advantage of the situation rather than admit that their own military killed their people yeah. um, to blame it on the Russians. Well, they're not going to admit that. Like they would, yeah. they, They're not just going to come out, oh, this was our bad. Like We accidentally you know, misfired this missile, and here we are. Like, yeah. Cause, um, and they really, and if, you can't really blame them because if they came out and said something like that, I mean, what would that do to the morale of the country as far as like we're fighting the good fight, you know, that that kind of it kind of puts a damper on things as far as we're the good guys here, you know? Yeah. Um, so I actually didn't even have to find it. Um, yeah. So uh, I think it came from Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, there was a story about um, the U.S. doing an atomic bomb test yeah. and they uh or actually, no, maybe it was just a sortie because they used to keep bombs in the air all the time uh, oh, yeah. during the Cold War. Yeah. Um, so that there were uh, planes on alert in the air with atomic bombs that flew around the U.S. In case the U.S. was bombed, they'd have planes that were had already taken off to, uh, to go launch bomb. a counterstrike in yeah. Russia. Right? Yeah. Um, well, so something went wrong yeah. over North Carolina, and they dropped... An atomic bomb. Yeah. Um, and there were like, I, I can't remember, like there were between nine and 11 um, safeties on it. Yeah. And it bypassed all but one. Wow. And so on the last, you know, the last safety mechanism, the yeah. bomb did not go off. Wow. <laughs> Amazingly. Now, and so the, you know, part of the story about it is that, well, if they had accidentally dropped an atomic bomb in North Carolina and it had gone off, yeah. the U.S. government would never have admitted that it was their mistake. Oh, they yeah. would have blamed it on the Russians. Yeah. And which started have, a nuclear which war. Which would have started a nuclear war, yeah. Yeah. Instead of taking the, I mean, and it would be a horrible tragedy, but... The, yeah. Well, obviously it would <laughs> yeah. be a horrible tragedy, but the the right thing to do there would be to own up to it mm -hmm. and be like, look, this is what happened and it sucks, but it would prevent us from going to nuclear war. Yeah. And you could still blame it on the Russians and say, well, you well, know, we wouldn't have Russians to have these things in the air if it wasn't for the Russians. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> take that take. Yeah. I mean, that's better than going to nuclear war and denying yeah. that you've done something that you've done. Yeah. You know, um, but it just goes to show it goes back to, I mean, to finish where we started, where government just can't be trusted with these type of responsibilities. It's just yeah. too incompetent. Um, and that's that's for all government. I mean, the same thing in Ukraine. Like, I'm, And it's self-interested. And I, I yeah. think that that's the what what people tend to forget. For some reason, people believe that when somebody is elected into government office to be a public servant, yeah, um, that they lose all sense of self or something and are concerned only with their constituents. Yeah. And that's just not the case. All these people are self-interested. And Absolutely. government as a whole is self-interested, which is yeah. why it continues to grow Absolutely. and accumulate more and more resources. Yeah. Um, it's just like, remember the the papacy during the, um, the medieval period yeah. that... Uh, accumulated a tremendous amount of land and wealth. And this is the the head of the church, a, a church that's based around having nothing. Yeah. You know, and all your rewards being in the next life. Yeah. yeah. But the church itself uh, was a political entity, yeah. and, and it was politically active as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, accumulated a tremendous amount of land and wealth and made decisions with that goal in mind. Yeah. And... All gov governments are certainly no better than the church. Oh, absolutely not. So, I mean, you get you get what you get. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good stopping point, yeah? I think so. All right. Well, uh, we, we kept it reasonably short this time, yeah. which we haven't done very well recently. Um, but we have been showing up every week. Yep, yep. Even on Good Friday. Even on Good Friday. On this Good Friday. So everybody have a happy Easter. Yeah. Um, we'll be back uh, next week. Um, 
In the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. Uh, like and share. Um, tell your friends. Uh, comment. You can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. Um, and you can visit the website as well, uh, which is thelibertymike.com. Yeah. Thelibertymike.com. The is important. The is important. <laughs> I Okay, so a <laughs> little, little backstory here. Um, I started to think that like all the best bands were the whatever. Oh yeah. Right. It's the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, the Grateful Dead. Yeah. You know, seems to others, others may not agree with me that those are the great bands, but, um, (laughs) but from my perspective, the best bands were always the, whatever they were. Yeah. And so I, we are the Liberty Mike. We are the Liberty Mike. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, Friday, I guess. Yeah. I think we need to plan on Friday. All right. Um, so we, yeah, we should be back next Friday. Um, so yeah, we'll, regardless, we will get you a podcast in another week and, uh, and that one we will finally get right. (laughs) And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. (laughs)